Morning, everyone. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was sharing about the miracle the Lord worked for me with my printer and, uh, and being able to print out my sermon. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's presumption for me to ask him to keep doing that for me. <laughs> uh, but I did. Uh, where it hadn't been working for two weeks, I plugged it in again today and it started right up this morning. So I was getting ready to print out my sermon, but there was an error in the printing and it wouldn't print. And I said, Lord, why did you start this up if you weren't going to let it print? <laughs> and uh, so I prayed about that some more and there was another miracle that took place because the, for any of you who are in, um, you know, no computer, sometimes I say, uh, click on the troubleshooting thing and we'll try and figure out what's wrong. I have never had a troubleshoot fix anything. <laughs> this morning it fixed it and my printer printed. So, you know, I'm saying there's another miracle. So I was thinking about Elijah. He just had a miracle and then he had to pray and pray and pray and pray again. Uh, and I thought, well, that, that's my experience. The Lord's teaching me in little things. I, so I just wanted to share another miracle with you today. Troubleshoot actually worked for once. But um, that, uh, that's always encouraging when, something, uh, when the Lord does some, something little like that. The title of the talk this morning, as I actually got it to Hannah in time, is Behold the Lamb of God. And that's a powerful statement. And so um, I feel like I need to kneel and consecrate myself for the Spirit to use this morning. So will you join me? Our Father in heaven, I kneel before you this morning and ask for a blessing. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I pray for forgiveness for my selfishness, my self-centeredness. I pray, Lord, that you will take that away this morning so that you can speak, that you can be heard, and that your word will be fruitful and not return to you empty. Lord, I pray that as we study this morning, your presence will be here, that your spirit will Fill this little room, fill every heart, and open every ear. Lord, I pray that you will bless us today because we've been here and we have heard you speak. So be with each one of us, Lord, as we come together, as we seek a blessing. And we thank you for the blessings that we've asked because we know that we have received them. Because we know it's your will and we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, John chapter 1, verse 29 is the scripture text this morning, uh, it's in your bulletin, John chapter 1, verse 29. This is John writing about John the Baptist, and he wrote in verse 29, the next day. John sees Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So when Scripture seems to repeat the same idea many times, we can conclude that it is an important point that God wants us to notice and God wants us to learn. And in my own thinking, you know, repetition seems to mean that it must be more important because the more times it's said, the more important it is for us to get the message. But in this Bible text, in this passage, I think the opposite is true. When God says it only once or twice, he wants us to pay particular attention. And then he wants us to seek out 
those possible correlations and those possible comparisons, parallel scriptures that talk about this. And in this powerful instruction, behold the Lamb of God, this one is used only two times in scripture. Only two times. And both of these times are the words of John the Baptist down at the Jordan River. Both statements are recorded by the Apostle John in the first chapter of John. It's the only place you find, behold, the Lamb of God. Inspiration tells us that these words were uttered by John under the impress and the impression of the Holy Spirit. And that he did not fully understand what they meant himself. And so he had to go back and restudy the prophecies of the Messiah to understand what it meant the Lamb of God. And these statements were startling in what they declared and in what they implied. John chapter 1 verse 26, just up from the verse we just read, the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders of his day had come out there saying, who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you Christ? Are you that prophet? And he says, no. He says, no. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. They knew what that phrase meant. That phrase meant that he was the forerunner of the Messiah. He was announcing the advent of the Messiah that they had looked for for so long. That's what he was claiming to be. It's the crier that went out ahead of the king who was to come. So this was a clear and unarguable reference to the prophecies that the Messiah was about to come. And then he said, He it is who coming after me is preferred before me and whose shoes I'm unworthy to untie. Clearly, John the Baptist was claiming that the man who was to come was greater than he. The one that even he was unworthy to untie his shoes. And John the Baptist was generally believed to be a great prophet in his day, and many of the scribes and Pharisees believed he was a prophet. And then after he had said, I'm not worthy, he is so much greater than I. The next day, Jesus, he announces, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And then he follows that statement with this one. He says, This is he of whom I said, He will come after me. This man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. He was claiming that Jesus was before him. And I'm not sure he understood what the Holy Spirit told him to say that time either. For he was before me. Here John intentionally links the Lamb of God to the Messiah. Now the Jews were expecting a Messiah who was, who was supposed to become as a conquering king. Not as a lamb. Not as a sacrificial offering. And this really shook up their theories, as I'm sure it was intended to do. As I looked at that statement, Behold the Lamb of God, I found that it can have two meanings depending on your use of the word of. Now if I said, there's a whole tree of cherries, I would mean that the tree has or possesses cherries. Now if I said, if I referred to Don Quixote, the man of La Mancha, I would be saying that Don Quixote was from La Mancha. So when we hear, behold the Lamb of God, we can take it to mean, behold the Lamb from God, or we can take it to mean, behold God's Lamb. And the wonderful thing is here that it doesn't matter which way we may hear it, because both are true. Both ways are true. The Lamb is from God, and He is God's Lamb. Now using this interpretation, using either interpretation, there is only one other place in Scripture where we find a Lamb from God, or God's Lamb.
Do you know where that is? Where is that? The lamb from God? Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 22. Verse 7 says, And Isaac said unto Abraham his father, He said, My father. And Abraham responded and said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And just as in the behold, the Lamb of God can be interpreted two different ways, so can also God will provide himself can be interpreted two different ways. It can mean God will provide a lamb or God will provide himself as the lamb. And again, both are true. Because this story of Abraham and Isaac is the only other place in Scripture where God provided the lamb. And so when John said, Behold the Lamb of God, I believe the Holy Spirit was speaking through John to draw attention to the story of Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Because that sacrifice on Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac was prophetic. God sent Abraham to Mount Moriah, which became the hill upon which Jerusalem was built. God sent Abraham to offer his son where God offered his son. The Holy Spirit was trying to open the eyes of the people to the true mission of their Messiah when he inspired John to proclaim, Behold the Lamb of God. In Genesis 22, it talks about God saying, now I know that you trust me. Now I know that you're obedient. It's true that the obedience of Abraham was tested to see if he had finally developed complete faith in God. But on a much deeper level, I believe that God revealed his heart to Abraham in a way that he had never done so before. God demonstrated the plan of salvation in a way that he had never done so before. Hebrews says that Abraham offered up Isaac. Even though he was not required to actually do it. His willingness was counted to him as though he had actually done it. In the story, Abraham represents, the story is figurative of God and his relationship with his own son. Abraham represents the God figure. Isaac represents the Christ figure. God choosing to sacrifice his own son. Abraham was an old man. Isaac was a young man. Isaac could have run away. He could have gotten away. And Abraham couldn't stop him, but Isaac submitted to the will of his father. Jesus submitted to the will of his father, even though he didn't want to when he said, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But he submitted to the will of the father. Abraham learned and felt what God was going to feel when he would have to kill his own son. 
God opened his mind to Abraham in a way that he had never opened it to anybody else before. Here God revealed what it was going to cost him to save sinful humanity. God would provide himself a sacrifice, and he would himself be the sacrifice at the same time. And in, back in John chapter 1, in nearly the same breath, the Lamb of God and the Son of God are presented as one and the same. So in John chapter 1, verse 29... That's the, mem that's the text we had read to begin with. John sees Jesus coming and he says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Verse 30 says, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. Who sent him to baptize with water? The Holy Spirit did. Yes, God did. He who sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. He says in verse 34, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. This is the Son of God. The Lamb of God the Son of God. God was going to offer His own Son as the one and only Lamb for His people Israel. Until the revelation to Abraham, the identity of that promised seed, the one who was promised in Eden, the one whose heel would be crushed and who would crush the head of the serpent, the identity of that promised seed was a mystery. All Adam and Eve knew was that the seed of the woman was to be some human son in the future. And they had hoped that Cain was he. Until Abraham's experience on the mountain, God's people apparently had no concept that the promised one would actually be the son of God. Now there's a proverb of the Jews from the Talmud that reveals Hebrew thought. And in essence it says, he who saves a life saves the world. And when God's lamb, the one that was in the thicket, saved the life of Isaac on Mount Moriah, it symbolically saved everyone descended from him. It also saved the entire nation of Israel who descended from Isaac, and consequently the whole world because Jesus descended from Isaac. Jesus died once for all. It was some 500 or more years after Abraham that the next phase of the revelation of the plan of salvation was presented to the world. When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, the thoughts of the hearers should have been or could not have helped but been drawn to the sacrificial system as a whole, to that twice daily offering of lambs in the temple in Jerusalem. In the day of John the Baptist, the temple services had been continuous for 483 years. And they had been in existence for nearly a thousand years before that, when the first tabernacle was built at the foot of Mount Sinai. And up until the time that the tabernacle was built, God's faithful had brought their sacrifices to God individually as, as heads of the household. And they had killed the animal and they burned it up on the altar. And that was pretty much it. But this new system established by God at Sinai expanded on that process and brought to light in a much clearer 
in a more detailed manner just how God was saving his people. I had Hannah insert into your bulletin a statement from Great Controversy, page 488. It says, The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. The sanctuary system was designed to help us understand how God's plan of salvation works and how we're to cooperate with it. And according to this statement that I just read, it's critical for us to understand it or we will not be able to have faith, not to have enough faith to stand through the end times or to do the work that God has assigned to us. The study of the sanctuary, the study of its structure, of its furniture, of its services is so vast and so deep a subject, the scholars have written many books on it and have yet to exhaust the wonders revealed there. The sanctuary services highlight have multiple levels of interpretation and multiple levels of application. They have historic significance in that the services memorialize the past experiences of the people, of the nation. It, it memorializes the experiences of the nation of Israel. It works, memorializes the works of God in the past and in the history of the world. And these services have prophetic significance as well. They foretell the future experiences of each individual of God's nation and his people, of the world, as well as describing the future acts of God himself. In addition to being historical and prophetic, the sanctuary describes the present position and the present work of each of these parties, of individuals, of nation, of world, of God, of Christ our high priest. And as we physically follow the path from the outside from outside the courtyard into the most holy place, we, ta we trace a path from slavery and sin to absolute freedom in the presence of our holy God. And those who have been around Adventism very long know well the structure and the furnishings of the sanctuary. We're familiar with the services and the ministry of the priests and of the high priests. The importance of the sanctuary is highlighted by the book of Hebrews. And the sanctuary is at the center of the book of Revelation. The book of Hebrews confirms the reality of the sanctuary in heaven and says that the one that Moses built was just a copy of the one in heaven. And Paul describes scenes from the sanctuary in heaven. In the book of Revelation... Well, back in Hebrews again. Hebrews confirms the reality of that sanctuary in heaven and it confirms and shows us what the work is that's going on for sinners in the sanctuary today. And in Revelation, there's a multitude of refer references to sanctuary services and themes. There's fire and incense. There's a lamb as it had been slain. There are golden lamps, invitations to eat with Jesus. In Revelation, we see the throne of God surrounded by angels. Doors opened into other rooms and a view of the Ark of the Covenant. There's judgment, there are robes, there's washing and purification, and there is a final cleansing from sin. There is God meeting his people face to face. And there is a final and permanent solution to sin and sinners. All of these things are found in the sanctuary and its services. And for a quick review of the sanctuary and the work done there, I would recommend that each of you go and read chapter, 15, or chapter 30 in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets. It's only 15 pages. You can get through it this afternoon. 
Chapter 30, Patriarchs and Prophets. It's 15 pages. There is a description of the structure and its furnishings and its services. And to describe them, it's just barely to scratch the surface of the subject of the sanctuary. Because the heart of it is the spiritual work. The spiritual work of forgiveness, of cleansing, removal of sin. And all this is done in pictures, a diorama, if you please, to help all of us, both literate and illiterate, both the simple and the wise, to see how God is working to save each one of us, each one of them. The tabernacle of Israel was constructed in the desert, and it was fittingly called the wilderness of sin. And when people came into the courtyard of the tabernacle, they were coming out of the wilderness of sin to the house of God. And it was constructed according to a plan given to Moses. And God was very particular that everything should be just right. Because every aspect of the sanctuary had symbolic significance, had symbolic meaning, and demonstrated heavenly and holy ideas and holy things. Everything had to be perfect because everything pointed to Jesus. And Jesus was perfect in every way. For those of you who haven't studied the sanctuary, who haven't read about it, haven't seen diagrams or pictures of it, the sanctuary building itself was surrounded by a white linen fence. That fence was between eight and nine feet high. So you couldn't see the people in there, but you could see the sanctuary above that, the beautiful building. And there was only one gate in the fence. Symbolic? Absolutely. Jesus says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Only one gate. When we see white linen in scripture, what does it mean? It's the robe of righteousness that Jesus provides. White linen is purity, it's righteousness. And so, so when you come through the gate, when you come through Jesus, you are surrounded by white linen. You are surrounded in symbol by the righteousness of Christ. Even before your lamb is sacrificed because you believe. See, so even before, even before Christ came, people were saved by the righteousness of Christ because they believed even before the sacrifice actually took place. It's symbolized here in the sanctuary service. When they entered through the gate, they entered the courtyard where the work was done. What happened there? A sinner would bring their offering, would bring their lamb, and they would come to the priest. They would kill the animal, they would cut its throat, and the blood would be spilled out and poured out, and the priest would catch some of it and take it into the sanctuary. They met at the altar of burnt offering and there was fire. Fire is a symbol of purification. Fire is a purifying agent. And what was supposed to happen there? Sin was supposed to be burned up there. The sinner would confess their, head on the, the, their sin on the head of the lamb. The lamb would die for that sin and then that sinner would be burned up in fire. There were what was called the daily, two lambs, one in the morning and one in the evening that were offered, that were always being offered for God's people. 
Even those who didn't know they were sinners were covered by the sacrifice of the daily. Even those who made mistakes and didn't know, they were covered. The priest would take the blood in a bowl and he would head towards the sanctuary itself. And he'd have to go to the laver. A laver was a basin with water where he had to wash and be purified before he entered. What you have here is somebody who was already purified who needed to be washed again. Where do we see that? At the Last Supper, don't we? They were already clean, every whit. They'd already been purified. They'd already been baptized. But now they needed to be washed again. The laver symbolizes the water of life. It symbolizes baptism to be washed in the water. And as the priest entered the tabernacle, he had to go into the holy place. He had to pass through a veil. The veil is Jesus. The veil represents Jesus. It was a beautiful curtain. It was a beautiful curtain, red and blue and scarlet, with gold and silver embroidery in it. The veil that stands between us and a holy God. Jesus as our mediator, our intercessor. That's what the veil stands for. That's what the curtain stands for. In the holy place, there were articles of furniture. And if you counted all the articles of furniture, you know that there's a table of bread on one side, the lampstands with, with the lamps on the left side, and in front there is right up in front of the most holy place, there is an altar of incense. And all of these items are made of gold. And gold is symbolic. What is gold symbolic of? What is God's church council to do in Laodicea? Buy of me gold. Try it in the fire. What is that? Pardon? It's pure. That's true. Faith. All of this sanctuary, the inside of the building, was gold-plated. Everything was gold. It was beautiful. It was to represent purity and the role of faith in every aspect of what was going on in there. The table of showbread had 12 loaves of unleavened bread on it, and it was sprinkled with incense, frank incense. That's on the right as you go in the door. On the left is the candlestick, seven branch candlestick, seven being the number of perfection. The light of the world. Who's the light of the world? It's Jesus. Who is the bread of life? It's Jesus. Who is the one who prays for his people? It's Jesus. Everything in the sanctuary is Jesus. It represents Jesus. And before the, before the right after the uh, um, altar of incense is another veil. Again, a beautiful one. Again, representing Jesus. And behind that is the Ark of the Covenant. The covenant has angels. The Ark of the Covenant has angels on it and a mercy seat. And at the heart of the Ark of the Covenant are the commandments of God. It's called the Ark of the Covenant, which is God's contract with his people. And over the mercy seat is the Shekinah glory, the glory of God. There was always glowing over the top 
of that final curtain, that final veil, they could see the glow of God's presence behind that veil. And only the high priest could go there. Only the high priest could see that presence. Because the high priest is who? It's Jesus. Represents Jesus. The Shekinah glory was the glory of the I Am. The I Am who met Moses in the burning bush. The I Am who went to Egypt and performed great miracles. The I Am who gave the law and wrote it on tables of stone. That's Jesus. Because Jesus said in John... He says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus claimed to be the God of the Shekinah glory. Everything in there is about Jesus. Everything in there points to Jesus. Jesus wrote the law. Jesus is the God of the Shekinah glory. Jesus is the one who has mercy at the mercy seat. And we have angels embroidered on all the curtains, and we have angels embroidered on the ceiling panels, on the draperies that are hanging across the ceiling, because the entire universe is watching this drama of how God is saving sinful human beings. It's all about Jesus. So when we say, Behold the Lamb of God, and we're watching Jesus in the sanctuary service, we get a very big idea of how God is working for his people. The priests, as I said, the high priest is Jesus. He is our intercessor, our mediator. He is the one who offers his own blood. He's the one that prays on our behalf. He's the one that, and that's represented by the incense that he burns. It's the prayers that he's offering for us as well. You know, we know these words, justification, glorification, or sanctification and glorification. We talk about those. Has anybody ever heard those three, in a, you know, being talked about? Okay. Justification happens in the courtyard where the penalty for sin is paid and your sins are justified and you've got a no record against you. In the holy place, sanctification takes place. Sanctification is the eating, the praying, the sharing empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's the life we live now, empowered by the Holy Spirit. What happens? When we, when we enter into the, most holy, or into the holy place, we eat the bread of life. That's eating Jesus. We are to become, Jesus says, you are the light of the world now, right? How does that happen? Only through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, which is symbolized by the oil and the lamp. We are a light only as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you know how you come closest to God? The closest place to come to God in the holy place was at the altar of incense where prayer is offered. You are closest to God when you're on your knees. Sanctification is what happens after there's conversion, after the new birth. It's growing up. When you're born again, you're a babe. This is the growing up process here in the holy place where we are to feed on the bread, to witness and to pray. And then in the most holy place, glorification takes place. What happens? When the high priest comes out of the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, sin is done away with. God's people are blessed. The apostle wrote, he says, now let's go back to the most holy place. Because the most holy place is a symbol of heaven. It's a symbol of the holy city. And it is the symbol of the throne room of God. And the, and the chest, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat is God's throne. That's what it symbolizes. And you know why it symbolizes the holy city? Because the most holy place is four square. It's a cube. 
It's as tall as it is wide as it is long. And when you go to Revelation and he measures the city, it's as tall as it is wide as it is long. And in that holy city is the throne of God on high. And so the most holy place is a symbol of heaven itself. Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says in verse cha in Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, I think it is, verse 16 and 17, he says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. All of the actions, all of the symbols, all of the furniture describes and, and that describe the interior and the spiritual life of every believer. The sanctuary service is supposed to be a demonstration of what's going on in our hearts. It's supposed to show us how God works in our hearts. From condemnation to forgiveness, from forgiveness to commitment, from commitment to reformation, and from reformation to coronation, at every step, our high priest is there doing the work in us. Philippians 1 verse 3 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, Paul writes to the Philippians, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What's the critical word here? Confidence. Confidence in what? In him doing the work he has promised. The sanctuary services require that the sinner trust in the priest. That even though the priest was out of sight, they had to trust that he was still performing the work of the mediator for the sinner. Even when the priest came out of the sanctuary, the sinner still needed to accept and trust that the priestly ministration had been completed and that it was effective for him. We are waiting for our high priest to come out of the most holy place. We cannot see what he is doing there, but we have been told what he is doing there, and we've had demonstrated for us what he is doing there in the sanctuary services. So we have to trust without seeing. Isn't that what Jesus told Thomas? He says, because you've seen, you believe, but blessed are those who believe without having seen. This is our position now. Most of the Christian world is only offering the sacrifice in the courtyard and then they walk away without waiting for their priest to come out. They do not know or acknowledge that there is a work to be done after the sacrifice. A work of reformation and a cleansing to be accomplished in us through the ministry of our high priest. A work that is to fit us to meet our God face to face. When Jesus comes, what's going to happen? Those who are not prepared are going to cry for the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne. And God's people are going to say, Behold, this is our God. We've waited for him and he will save us. That's what's happening. So we are being prepared now through the ministration of Jesus through our high priest, we're being prepared to meet God face to face. Where are we, each of us in our sanctuary journey? Are we in the courtyard, surrounded by the white linen representing the robe of Christ's righteousness and waiting for his return? Or have we offered the sacrifices and walked away leaving the confines of that pure white robe? Are we washing daily in the water of life? Are we drinking daily of the water of life? Are we eating daily of the bread of life? 
Are we daily witnessing through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that lets us be a light to the world? Are we continually offering prayer to God on behalf of others? Are we interceding at the altar of incense? The important thing to remember is that Jesus must be inside our soul temple. He must be inside our soul sanctuary. He must be inside us directing and performing each of these activities through us. Now we've been told that when we come closer to Jesus, the closer we come, the more glaring our faults will appear. The more sinful we will see ourselves. No matter how sinful we feel, no matter how sinful we appear to ourselves, we must remember that we have a high priest who is not only ministering for us in the heavenly sanctuary, but he is ministering in us in the sanctuary of our heart. Just like the sinner in the courtyard, we cannot often see what our high priest is doing in us. but we have to trust that he is doing it. That it will be enough. That he will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We need to see Jesus. We need to trust Jesus we need to see where he is and what he's doing and know that he is trustworthy even though we can't recognize any progress in this sinful heart that we have. We may not recognize it. Other people probably will. Let's hope they do. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he says, For I know whom I have believed. I know. That's confidence. And I'm persuaded, I'm convinced that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, which is my very salvation. Have you trusted your salvation to Jesus? Or are you trusting in your own? And he says in verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto you, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. Thou therefore, my son, my friends, little children, be strong in the grace of that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold your high priest. Keep your mind's eye on Jesus. He is trustworthy. He keeps his promises. He is a sin-pardoning Savior. He is a heart transformer. He does his work through the Holy Spirit, which is in you. Jesus said to have the faith of the little child who knows no fear because he knows without a question or a doubt that his daddy will keep him safe and take care of everything. To have that kind of confidence. Do we have reason for confidence? We do have reason for confidence. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son, the Lamb of God, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And now God himself directed that the priest pronounce this benediction upon his people. Numbers chapter 6. Lord, bless thee and keep thee 
the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the pictures that you have drawn to us in your sanctuary of the work that Jesus is doing for us even when we can't see it. We pray, Lord, that our hearts will be fixed, our minds and our eyes will be fixed on Jesus, that we will acknowledge his work in us and for us and let him do the work that he desires to do. Purify us. Make us holy. Present us faultless and blameless before the throne of our Father. Lord, give us the faith for this time to trust that no matter how we feel, no matter how it looks, that we have a high priest who knows what it's like to be one of us and that we can trust him with our very salvation. Jesus, take our sins, wash them away, make us pure and holy because we want to see you face to face. This is our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen.